Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Wednesday, December 27, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps. Well, actually not live. No. Sorry. I lied. Live to tape. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. Oh, it's vacation time, folks. It's vacation time, and it's the last week of 2017. You know what that means. Best of all this week on the Majority Report. Now we're going to throw you a curveball. You're thinking like, oh, okay. I get it. Best of 2017. That means the best of shows of 2017, right? So today is a show going to be one of the best from 2017, right? Wrong. Trick to you. We had a lot of people who said, we want to hear Stephanie Kelton. She is now a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. But we had her on in September. And I thought, oh, a lot of people listened to her then. Maybe what we should do is have her on from the first time I think she was on. I think this is the first time. And it was May 22nd of 2014, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And at that time, she was the chair of Department of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And it was a similar interview. But understand, at that time, people were worried about hyperinflation. That was the big thing we were hearing. Oh, we're going to have hyperinflation. Better, better get your gold. Why in 2014? I don't remember that. Well, because it was still fresh from like the uh, quantitative easing. And I think by that point, it was like Q2 or Q3. I'm not sure. QE2, I think it was. Quantitative easing number two. Now, look, there were problems with quantitative easing insofar as they gave the money to the wrong people. They gave it to the banks instead of giving it directly to the homeowners or just, frankly, dropping it out of a helicopter. But the problem was not, oh, we're going to have Weimar Republic inflation. It's going to cost me $1,000 to get a hot dog. And this is relevant because what Stephanie Kelton is going to tell you, which is a theory that has gained a lot more traction, frankly, since even since 2014, um, is that deficits in and of themselves, do not matter. That national debt for a country such as ours, which has control over its currency, which is wh- whose currency is so widely accepted around the world, and whose economy is fundamentally sound, if not just, and it's, I mean, let's face it, it's not just. I mean, it goes... <laughs> But the amount of resources that it's generating, you know, makes us a fairly stable economy. And she's going to explain to you, if you do not understand this concept, of why there is an inverse proportion between the government's debt and private debt. And if you want the private sector to have more money you want the government to actually have a deficit what that's not what we've been told we've been told that when the deficit goes up we're going to have to cut taxes and tighten our belt and sit around the kitchen table like everybody's like everybody in the country there's going to be a huge kitchen table there's going to be 300 million people sitting around it and daddy is going to tell us we're going to have to cut back folks that's just not the way it works and this has important implications Because as much of a crap show as this Republican tax bill is, because it redistributes the money in such a way that it concentrates it in very few hands, there's a lot of problems associated with that. Economic and political problems associated with it. But 
the one problem is not that it's going to increase the deficit. It, it's that it's going to increase the deficit because we're spending money on stuff that is not necessary. In other words, tax cuts for wealthy people. What we should do is increase the deficit, fine, that same amount, but spend it on free college. Spend it on Medicare for all. Spend it on mm, infrastructure improvements, education. I mean, a myriad of things. All right, well, so here uh, is uh, Professor Stephanie Kelton from 2014 going to explain to you that what you think about you, what you think you know about money is in fact wrong. And after that, we'll have some of the best of fun half stuff for you. Matt Picks. All right. Enjoy. On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome back uh, to the program Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, also Editor-in-Chief of the blog New Economic Perspectives. She also hosts a, a, her own podcast, which you should check out, uh, on um, uh, MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Uh, Stephanie Kelton, it's a pleasure to have you back. Thanks so much. Glad to be back. Uh, so now I, I, we're going to have to we're, I, I want to cover some of the stuff that we talked about. I guess it was now almost uh, uh, two years ago um, uh, in covering some of the basics about modern monetary theory. Now, when we spoke last time, the uh, uh, the we were dealing with things like the fiscal cliff and the threat by the Republicans to not um, uh, not pay our debt obligations. Uh, and um, it, it, it's a it's a different time in some respects and, and, and not in more important respects. And specifically, uh, the deficit is about half of where it was or pretty close um, when we uh, spoke. Yet our economic situation, which flies in the face of everything we were told by all of these uh, the uh, the. The great thinkers in in Washington uh, was that our economic situation has not changed in many respects, um, and and so before we get to that, let's let's just go back uh, and and explain this notion of how we're living in a different uh, era in terms of our monetary uh, policy, uh, but we're not, uh, but but we have yet to sort of adjust to that. So let's go back and just. Let's talk about Bretton Woods for a moment. What what is Bretton Woods? When did that happen, and, and uh, what has changed since then? Sure. So uh, Bretton Woods was an international monetary system that was set up uh, after World War II, and uh, the basic thinking was that you know the world needed some uh, stability after the war, and that what we what we ought to do is set up a system where uh, we had fixed exchange rates. So what you had were 44 countries coming together and agreeing to participate in this construction and creation of this monetary system set up to fix the value of one country's currency relative to another country's currency. And through, so what happened is 43 countries said, we agree it's going to be the U.S. dollar. We'll all fix our currencies to the value of the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. said, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll agree to convert dollars into gold at a fixed price. And so it was a form of a, a gold standard system, a fixed exchange rate system, and it was in place, um, as you said, from uh, 1944, from the end of the war, all the way up until Nixon um, ended it in 1971. So we went from a system of, of fixed exchange rates where one country's currency exchanged for another country's currency at a fixed price and threw the U.S. dollar into gold at a fixed price to a system where most currencies in the world today are what we call floating currencies. They're uh, no longer fixed to another country's currency or a basket of currencies or gold or anything else. They, uh, the value of the currency changes from day to day hour to hour, minute to minute in financial markets. So it's a, a very different type of monetary system that we have today. That's right, because uh, when we went off gold in 1971, everything changed. But in some respects, um, we, 
we have yet to really our, our policymakers have yet to really uh, adjust to that new world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think that there has been a full appreciation. In fact, I think it's pretty clear there hasn't been a full appreciation of the magnitude, the significance of that change and what it means for policy. So, I mean, I think in terms of the the policy space that's available to us and the policy space was just a whole lot smaller on a gold standard, on a fixed exchange rate system than it is today now that we're off of that type of system. So we have degrees of freedom available to us that we didn't have under the old monetary arrangements, uh, but we still, because we fail to appreciate that, we act like we're still trapped in an old gold standard framework. You know, it's sort of like the textbooks that were written in the 60s uh, and 50s where we had that monetary system in place haven't really been revised a whole lot since then. We sort of repeat the same sorts of stories about the way the economy works and the way government budgets work and so forth, um, not recognizing that things changed in 71 and we should rewrite the textbooks because it really does make a whole lot of difference in terms of, you know, the policy options that are available. All right, so let's talk about those those policy options. I mean, um, when uh, what specifically did it free us up to do, uh, and, mm-hmm. and 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 what we're not taking advantage of? Well, I mean, the biggest thing is that when when you're pledging to convert your currency, so let's just talk about the U.S. If you're pledging to convert your currency on demand at a fixed price into gold, which is itself something that's finite, then you have to be pretty careful about how much spending you do, uh, how big your deficits get, and so forth, you know, the type of monetary policy that you run. Because if you start creating too much of your own currency and people want to convert the currency into gold, but there's only so much gold available, then you can undermine the very foundation of your monetary system. So you've got to be pretty careful uh, about how much you actually spend and the, how aggressive your monetary policy is and so forth when you're on a system like that. Now, today, because the government doesn't pledge to convert dollars into anything else, uh, it doesn't have to be careful in the same way that it did on a gold standard. It still has to be careful because, of course, you can still get an inflation problem. Um, so what the government can do today that it couldn't do back then is focus exclusively on um, how much it's adding in terms of spending in the economy relative to how much demand it's taking away by taxing, and it can target economic goals like full employment with a mind only to the inflationary effects in the real economy and not having to worry about whether it's got enough of this shiny yellow metal to support its monetary system. Okay, now this is uh, now this is this is weedy stuff. So I I I, I want to sort of uh, sure. I want to go back over this so that people really understand this concept. When 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 essentially our dollars were certificates for redemption of gold, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, d- it, it limited the amount that we could print uh, essentially of dollars because. That day that somebody could come in and say, yeah, all, all the people who have those certificates could come back and say, I want to redeem my certificate. And if we don't have the gold to uh, back that up, we're in big trouble. And like you say, gold is a finite resource. So we can still have inflation. But, but tell us how inflation was created in that, in that scenario. Or, I mean, tell us what the danger was. Like what would happen back when we were on the gold standard if if that uh, came to pass, where people say, I, I want the gold now. Mm-hmm. So, well, what happens is, if, if governments are promising to convert their currency into something else, and there's only so much of that thing, then what happens when people start demanding the underlying asset, they want the gold or they want somebody else's currency, the government tries to protect its foreign exchange reserves, its gold or the other country's currency or whatever. And the way that it tries to protect it is by offering people an alternative. So the government could say, look, don't convert your dollars into gold because we're worried that we're running out of gold. We don't want you to do that. How about instead you agree to convert your dollars into U.S. treasuries? And people say, no, we don't want to convert to treasuries. We really want gold. And the government says, well, no, I really think you should take the treasury. Look here, I'll pay you more interest. It makes it more appealing. And I say, well, no, I still really think I want the gold. Well, how about if I offer this interest rate? And so 
interest rates become the tool that government uses to try to protect its uh, its reserve asset, whether it's gold or somebody else's currency. And so that's the real danger is that you lose control of the interest rate. And and so, you know, interest rates start going up and then all of a sudden you get all sorts of problems in your economy because people won't borrow and spend at higher rates of interest. And so what it, what it liberates you from, having a currency that's not convertible, not tied to gold or some other country's currency, is that it frees governments from... Uh, having to use their interest rates as a mechanism to compete with the ability of people to convert their dollars into something else. And so you can keep interest rates low. You can try to provide the right climate for, you know, borrowers and, and folks and businesses or households to, to borrow at low interest rates and buy homes or cars or refrigerators or whatever it is. It's supposed to be a better tool for central banks to be able to, you know, kind of tweak the economy by making these uh, modest adjustments in interest rates over time and not completely losing control of interest rates because they're trying to protect gold reserves. So, uh, in other words, um, the, the government can does not have to automatically worry about printing more money. It is... The, in other words, they don't have to worry about the, the, they don't have to fight on two fronts in some ways, right? They don't have to worry about their exactly. rear guard exactly. in, in terms of what they have for gold. They just have to worry about what the situation is in the economy. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It frees them of the need to obsess over the, uh, the foreign exchange reserves or the, or the gold reserves. That's exactly right. And so uh, and so when people, you know, um, I, I, rem I, I remember uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it was I was sitting in a green room with David Stockman. Uh, now, <laughs> let's refrain from sort of uh, from 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 judging his his uh, 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 from from judging from whence he comes uh, to formulate his opinions. But he was one of those people who are just like it is all going to come crash crashing down. We have the uh, uh, another uh, round of quantitative easing, and uh, with that we're going to turn into Weimar uh, Republic. We're going to turn into Zimbabwe. Explain to us why. What happened with Weimar, uh, the Weimar Republic, and what happened with Zimbabwe, and why that's not a problem for us in the circumstance we are in now? Okay. So uh, Stockman's concern, of course, is is sort of widely held, and lots of people looked at what the Fed was doing and cried hyperinflation, Weimar, and all that sort of stuff, because their models tell them so. So you know, in economics, people sometimes put their hand over their heart when they hear the name Milton Friedman and, you know, the, the models that were taught in economics are that if you increase the money supply or the rate of growth of the money supply, you get proportionate increases in prices or in the inflation rate. And so people just anticipate that's the way it's supposed to work. So they saw the Fed uh, doing QE, and it looks like printing money, and their you know hearts tell them, well, if the Fed is printing money, we're going to get inflation. If they're printing lots of money, we're going to get high inflation or hyperinflation. And then they make you know uh, these analogies to Weimar Germany or Zimbabwe. So what happened, you know, I'm not a historian, but I've studied this a little bit, and um, with, with Germany, what you had was, of course, Germany loses the war, is paying reparations, so there are war reparations. Um, Germany's trying to acquire gold in order to pay reparations, and so they're printing lots of Deutschmarks to buy gold. At the same time, you have the French and the Belgians come in and occupy a big section of the industrial production uh, facilities in Germany. And so you have the sort of old Milton Friedman problem of too much money chasing too few goods, uh, which results in inflation. But the reason you have too much money is not because you have some technocrat trying to you know, manage the economy and achieve full employment, but because you're printing Deutschmarks to buy gold, to pay reparations, and then you've lost a part of your productive capacity, so you can't produce the goods and services that that money is, is now going to chase. And so very complex um, sort of thing going on there. It's not the good old-fashioned, you know, an economy that gets overheated uh, in normal times that generates inflation. It's, a, it's happening on the supply side, and it's much more complex uh, sort of a thing going on. And in the case of uh, Zimbabwe, 
you know, you have Mugabe come to power, and uh, one of the things he does is, is redistribute land, and he takes land away from white farmers and redistributes it um, to black farmers with little and, in, in many cases, no farming experience. And so what ends up happening is that you get food shortages. And again, you know, this is not the kind of thing that you get because the Fed is doing QE. You've got all sorts of stuff happening on the supply side of the economy that allows too much money to end up with too few goods to chase. So um, there are ways to explain uh, hyperinflation, but uh, there's an interesting study that was done I don't know, a couple of years ago, I think, by two economists from the Cato Institute. So this is a, you know, libertarian uh, think tank. And it was, um, the study was done by a guy named Steve Hankey, and I always forget the other guy's name, but they spent three years doing this research. And they said, okay, what we want to do is we want to understand what causes hyperinflation. So we're going to do this comprehensive study where we look at every single case of hyperinflation that has ever occurred on planet Earth, and we want to study it and understand what caused it. And they found 56 cases of hyperinflation anywhere in the world ever in the history of time. And then they did an analysis, said, okay, in this case it was caused by this, in this case it was caused by this. And the most interesting thing about their study is not what it – what it shows or reveals, but what isn't there. And what isn't there is in none of those cases, 56 examples, you'd never have had hyperinflation in an otherwise well-functioning democracy. You get hyperinflation when you have, you know, a civil breakdown, you have a coup, you have the loss of a war, you have um, supply side shocks like the, you know, food that I mentioned in Zimbabwe. There's always something more complex going on than just that simple, printing money story that most people, I think, have in their heads. And, and as far as I understand the way you're explaining it, in, um, in, in, in Germany, they were printing money uh, for the sake of getting, of getting uh, essentially, of buying gold. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so the causal connection was, was sort of reversed in some way. Uh, as to wh why yeah. they were printing money, they weren't printing money um, to uh, to drive demand because demand was already there. What wasn't there was the ability to meet that demand, and that's back into uh, uh, y your story. And that's uh, you know the uh, so so having addressed that, let's talk about um, you know we came through this uh, financial crisis or. We're still in the wake of this financial crisis. There was all these pushing for austerity, which I think, I, I hope at least now, has been largely debunked as a response uh, to, to, uh, to dealing with this big output gap, right? I mean, because we, 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 mm -hmm. we, we didn't have, the, the, what happened is the demand basically went away uh, in that instance. And so um, the... What we should have been doing during that time, and I would argue probably still, is increasing demand. And, and, and so, so tell us how that would, I mean, how would, the, with the knowledge of modern monetary theory, theory uh, how would we have responded to this crisis differently? Uh, well, I'm not even sure that you need modern monetary theory to get the right uh, policy response. I think, you know, just understanding essentially Keynesian economics, the, the philosophy there would be what you just said, which is if you've got an output gap, the, the indication is that there's not enough total spending in the economy to buy all the stuff that businesses are capable of producing. If you want to get back to full employment, you've got increased spending. Um, and so where MMT comes in handy, I think, is in allowing you to recognize how much policy space is available so that you don't, out of one side of your mouth, talk about advocating for more spending and more aggressive fiscal policy, and out of the other side of your mouth, you're worrying about what's going to happen to the deficit and, you know, talking about the need to balance budgets longer term. So, um, you know, looking at the economy and what happened after the Great Recession, you're seeing an economy that was hemorrhaging jobs. I mean, at one point we were losing close to 800,000 jobs a month. 
so um, why do workers lose their jobs? Well, they lose their jobs because firms are laying them off, and why do they do that? Well, because they don't have the customers uh, buying their goods and services at a price that will turn a profit for them. And so it's pretty straightforward if, if capitalism runs on sales. And so the way to stem the, the, the loss there is to make sure that there are customers in the stores, that you've got the sales, because it's sales that – um, that firms are looking for, and when sales return robustly, business that's the clearest indication to businesses that it's safe to start hiring and investing again. So what would we have done? Well, I think m- probably much more aggressive, my colleagues and I were calling very early on in 2009 for a full payroll tax holiday. So, you know, this is the most direct way to put – money in the hands of those who are most likely to spend it. So you've got about 151 million Americans uh, working for a living and paying into Social Security. If we had uh, reduced payroll tax withholdings, that FICA uh, that you see on your paycheck, if we had just reduced that to zero for a period of time, um, it would have resulted in something close to $300 more a month in take-home pay for the average worker you're looking at you know close to seven hundred dollars a month for a, a couple making just a little bit above the average, and that's significant. So, you know, we were looking at an economy where the private sector was trying to deleverage. Households had too much debt, and many people were not going to go out and um, start borrowing and spending and kickstart the economy. They wanted to pay down debt. So, payroll tax holiday would be great for something like that. Put the money back in the hands of the people, and they will do one of two things. Probably they will pay down debt if they're struggling with high debt levels, and those who weren't uh, would go out and spend some or most of that income. And so, you know, that's something that we would have done. We would have been more aggressive on aid to state and local governments, uh, recognizing that state governments aren't like the federal government. They don't issue the currency, and they are dependent upon uh, the ability to um, collect taxes and borrow in order to spend, and most of them have to balance their budgets. And so we would have been uh, much more aggressive there in assisting state and local governments. And then finally, um, we like the idea of a, a jobs program modeled on the old New Deal programs like the WPA to CCC, the National Youth Administration, where you know, for those folks who didn't find employment after the other programs were put in place, well, you, you offer a job for anybody who's ready, willing, and able to work, but not able to find work uh, in the economy, and you do what Roosevelt did. You now, create employment opportunities for them. Now, I should say that I'm contractually obligated to myself to say that um, uh, the the I had a political problem with with a uh, moratorium on payroll taxes uh, simply Mm -hmm. because I, uh, and I think there were were a lot others who felt this way, that this would uh, end up being a very good argument that uh, for those who look to to cut Social Security benefits, that we need to cut Social Security benefits because of this moratorium. I would have much preferred uh, the sort of the George Bush style, we're sending to everybody, we've collected your taxes, Mm -hmm. now we're going to give you a rebate. Uh, from the general fund, um, but uh, that's simply that's more of a a, a, a political um, uh, question than it is an economic one. Now, the reason why we didn't do those things was because people were so concerned about the deficit and the debt here. And explain to people how, um, in a time where we have uh, such a low demand that when the government actually shrinks its deficit and then ultimately begins to shrink its debt, this is taking money out of, uh, of people's hands. Okay, so, you know, let's take an example and put some numbers to it because I think it might be more helpful that way. If I, if I say the government is spending 100, let's say dollars, into the economy, and they're taking 90 out by collecting taxes, then we label that a deficit. The government is running a deficit of 10. And we're so, I think, we're so trained, we're so accustomed to thinking in terms of the deficit as being something that's uh, undesirable and something, you know, it's something that's wrong and it ought to be fixed, that we forget that the 10 goes somewhere. If they spend 100 in and they take 90 out, somebody else ended up with the 10. And the 10 shows up in the non-government part of the economy. And so the government's deficit 
is, I like to call it the accounting record of a surplus somewhere else in the economy. But we don't think of it as a surplus because we forget about the other side of the balance sheet. And um, that's a real problem, you know. So we, we talk about, you know, Simpson Bowles and we say, well, Simpson Bowles has a plan to reduce the government's deficit by $4.1 trillion over the next 10 years. People say, well, that sounds great. Right? That's massive deficit reduction. Good for us. And then if you say the sentence differently and you say Simpson Bowles has a plan to reduce non-government surpluses, by $4.1 trillion over the next 10 years. People will say, why would they do that? That doesn't sound like a very good idea. Why would you want to reduce non-government surpluses? But they're identical statements. They're just looked at from two different sides of the ledger. And so it's a real problem getting, I think, doing the education that's required to allow people to have, feel more empowered in these discussions about the need to reduce deficits because since everybody is so convinced that deficits are a bad thing and it's in our national interest to reduce them. I mean, people go so far as to saying they're, you know, the deficit uh, is the greatest threat to national security or something. Well, I mean, God, any patriotic American would then say, okay, well, what do we have to do to get rid of the threat? And then, you know, our public officials tell us, well, we need shared sacrifice. And we say, well, okay, you know, I, I'm willing to do my part because I love my country, so let's get that deficit down. Now, and the interesting thing is, is that there really isn't a government economy and a private economy, right? I mean, there's, there's the economy, and there is, you could say there's a government sector, and you could say there's a private sector, but you could also say there's also a healthcare sector. There's also a, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, a, a building a cars sector, I guess. I mean, that, that seems to be the problem is that people don't, there's this sense that if the government takes your taxes, that somehow that money goes, sort of evaporates into a, another plane of existence and does not end up back in somebody, somebody's hands somewhere, and that's a human being in our society who's theoretically going out to the same stores as anybody else. Well, I mean, that, that happens when they spend it back in. That's, that's what the spending part does. It puts it somewhere in the economy. But the taxing part definitely does remove it. I mean, it, it does, in a sense, evaporate, right? It, it, if they only collected the tax, but they didn't spend it back in, then it's not going to show up anywhere else right. in the economy. Right. So you need those, right? You need those two things happening. So if they, if they put in 100 and take out 90, then you've got 10 showing up somewhere. Right. The problem is if you, if you, if you tax simply with the purpose of, of cutting your deficit and don't actually spend mm -hmm. that money, that's where the problem is. And, and, and decouple sure. Okay. And, and, and so, yeah, let's, yeah, sure. All right. Well, let's talk about the, the purposes of taxes, because I, I, the there are I think there is um, there's a there's a misunderstanding of why we need to collect taxes uh, in this age. If we are freed from a policy standpoint, when we have a, uh, a lack of demand in the economy, uh, tell us what the purposes of taxes are. Well, taxes do a lot of things in the economy. They certainly have impacts uh, and there are implications for the distribution of income, right? Uh, on whom taxes fall most heavily, where you collect and so forth uh, has distributional effects. But the one clear thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, that taxes do is they take purchasing power by taking income away from someone. That's every dollar that is taxed away from you is a dollar that you don't have to do one of two things with, save or spend. Uh, and so taxes remove, by removing income, remove purchasing power from the economy. That's really important uh, sort of thing that taxes do. This is something that, you know, what used to be widely recognized by economists, by Fed chairs and so forth, that, that this gave the government a powerful lever that it could pull when it was trying to um, manage an overheating economy. And so if you began to see inflation because, you know, there was your economy was up against its constraints in terms of being able to produce more stuff, but demand was running really high, well, then government could grab that tax lever and pull on it and cool things off. So you raise taxes, you take away income, people spend less. 
And so that's really one of the most important functions that taxes serve in the economy. And in contrast, if you're running, if your economy is running cold, then you just push the lever in the other direction. You leave more income in the hands of people who you think are most likely to go out and spend that additional income. So just, I mean, but we tend to think of taxes really differently, right? We think of taxes as the the mechanism by which the government gets money. And that the federal government, in order to be able to spend dollars, has to get the dollars from somewhere. We think that they need to get them from us because we have the dollars and they don't. And so they come to us and collect the dollars and then they spend the dollars. But if you think about it, it really doesn't make any sense. I mean, the United States government has a monopoly on the creation of the currency. They are the monopoly issuer of the U.S. dollar. It can't come from anywhere else. You know, a lot of stuff's made in China, but not U.S. dollars. They, the United States government says we claim the sole authority to issue the United States dollar. And if you do it and get caught, well, that's called counterfeiting. So we create the currency. It comes from us. And so this idea that somehow governments are revenue constrained, that they can't spend until they first come find the dollar somewhere, have to go out and get it, you know, uh, is really getting things quite backwards. So uh, just to and to clarify for people, when you say the economy runs hot, that is a function of demand outpacing supply. When it's cool, like we have now, supply outpaces demand. And uh, it is it is that dynamic the hot dynamic, which creates inflation, because if you have a lot of people who want to buy a car, uh, then the the guy selling the car is going to say, all right, I'll give it to the highest bidder. And, uh, and prices go up that way. So taxes function to cool down a... Um, uh, a, a an economy where the demand is outstripping the the supply. We should also say that I think uh, I mean and, and tell me I, I I believe you agree with this. Uh, taxes also give value to our money insofar as um, that is it, it, it gives value to the currency because the government's saying we'll only accept no chickens, no sheep, no. No firstborn. We're only going to accept the money that we tender to pay off your taxes. So you owe this. And, and basically people go out and and try and get money. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, uh, this is something you can find that exact same argument that you just made in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And you can find it running, you know, all the way through hundreds of years later into the work of Nobel Prize winning economists like James Tobin or Paul Samuelson. It's not a uh, really controversial idea, although it's not something that's usually emphasized by economists. But that's right. I mean, the government gets to declare how it's going to make its payments and in what form it's going to receive payments to itself. And we're all subject to tax obligations, and they get to tell us what we need to get in order to uh, pay our taxes. And so the ability that the government has to make and enforce those tax laws gives value to whatever thing they say we have to have. And in the U.S., of course, it's the U.S. dollar. Like in Germany, when they had the Deutschmark, they asked the people in poll after poll, do you want to give up the Deutschmark and go for a common currency in, in a part of Europe? People said, absolutely not. We love the Deutschmark. We're never giving it up. It's so stable. We work so hard to get here. No, we don't want any part of this uh, monetary union thing. Well, it didn't matter, right, that they really love the Deutschmark as soon as Germany said we're in, and henceforth we're only going to be making payments in euros, and we're only going to take euros in payment to us. Well, the euro suddenly had value, and everybody was willing to work for it and accept it and so forth. So, yes, you're, I, I do agree with you. All right, so let's turn to inequality. Um, and uh, you, you, you tweeted the other day, I wonder if uh, Hillary Clinton will run on a commitment to balancing the budget and addressing inequality and how that will turn out. Now, uh, if she if she did so, she would not be uh, she would not be unique, would be my guess. And in, in some respects, that is just sort of the conventional wisdom. Uh, so so tell us uh, why that's problematic. Obviously, you know. The last time we spoke, it was all uh, there was a, there was a lot more talk about the the debt and the deficit than there is now. And like I say, it's the deficit has been halved and that hasn't quite uh, brought us to nirvana. Um, but people are far more conscious of inequality. Uh, Thomas Piketty's book is is all the rage now. Why why won't that work? 
why are those two things at odds? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that happens when we start focusing our attention on deficit reduction is, you know, you pointed out earlier that there are lots of people who will look at Social Security and say, um, this is an unsustainable program. We've got to, you know, make tough choices and shared sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. We've got to get entitlements under control. And if we were to do that and we bought into that, we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to tackle this uh, budget problem. We're going to pay down the debt and we're going to reduce the deficit to even you know, further. Um, and one of the big concerns is that we've got problems with entitlements. So we're going to tackle those tough choices. We're going to have to cut benefits. You know, We can't afford to keep promises that we've made to the elderly and the, their dependents and the disabled. So benefits come down. Well, that's going to have a huge impact on inequality, right? Because this is one of the most important programs. I'm talking about Social Security in terms of keeping the elderly out of poverty. So we start, my, my concern is that we would end up with something like that, where we, we start choosing to reform programs or adjust spending and taxes in a way that exacerbates inequality for the purpose of trying to balance the budget and so forth. All right, so let's talk about uh, inequality. I mean, the uh, Piketty, and, and, and this has been the, the most criticized, I think, uh, part of his book in, in, in some respects, um, uh, suggests, and maybe somewhat offhandedly relative to the rest of his work, but um, that a, 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 a international, I guess, uh, a worldwide wealth tax would be the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we spoke to Thomas Frank, I guess it was a week or two ago, and uh, he was critical of, of that solution, and I imagine you are too. Uh, tell us why, if that's the case. Uh, no, I think you're right. I read Tom's uh, review of Piketty, and I think uh, it's probably my favorite of all the reviews I've read so far. And I think Tom's right. I mean, there, I don't, I don't know. With the global wealth tax, it just seems to me that uh, getting something like that actually adopted and enforced, and there are so many ways through accounting maneuvers um, to avoid paying taxes. So that just seems to me, on a variety of fronts, uh, probably the wrong way to go. And I think that Tom really hits the nail on the head because he says, look, when when inequality was not increasing rapidly, like, like what we're seeing today, this is the period of time where um, unions were, were most strong and most important uh, in the economy. And so um, he was surprised, and I was surprised, that uh, Tama does not talk about the importance of strengthening labor, particularly uh, bargaining through unionization. And so... Um, you know, there are a variety of ways to go at inequality. You can, if you if you just think about, you know, put one hand up high, put one hand down low, and you say, I want to reduce inequality, so I'm going to tax the hell out of the people at the top. Well, that lowers them, and inequality comes down, but it doesn't do anything for the people on the bottom. So what could you do for those on the bottom? How can you address inequality and also make the majority better off? Well, you increase the incomes of those at the bottom. So inequality goes down, but you're helping 99% of the population. And so, you know, I mentioned it, um, the, the job guarantee program. But if we had something like that, and some people want to have a program that's really generous. You know, Sandy Darity has been uh, proposing, he's at Duke, for a number of years, uh, a federally funded jobs program where you have wages scaled, and he's got some pretty um, generous wages, you know, 50000 and maybe even higher, but then you have a benefits package as well. So you can have, you know, wages and benefits that include health care, um, vacation time, child care. I mean, you can get as uh, creative as you want with some of this stuff. This would do more to increase the well-being of those at the bottom, and then it would ratchet upward because, it, you know, depending on how aggressive you get, that becomes the de facto minimum. So any other employer in the economy who wants to hire a worker is going to have to compete with this wage and benefit package, and you can lift an awful lot of people up out of poverty um, and I think deal with the sorts of inequality 
problems that uh, Picatee helps you know people really sort of um, recognize and, and the growing problem with programs that are designed to lift those at the bottom. So you know, just to be clear, the idea of that that you know taxation may do something on the on the top end and and you know something like particularly like the estate tax i think is one of those mm-hmm. things that sort of prevents us from having an aristocracy but if you really want to tackle inequality the you have to in conjunction maybe with some other uh, government policies that would strengthen people's ability to unionize and and, and leverage their bargaining power in uh in mm-hmm. the economy you got to spend that money is basically what it comes down exactly. to right i mean that's that's it's a two part process and if you just stop at the taxation and you uh say we're going to cut the deficit it doesn't really have the impact that you want to have other than maybe preventing an aristocracy that's exactly right i agree completely with that and 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 i should say that i also think you know there is there is a path there, but it's more it's more of a political argument on some level. When you when you tax the high end, you decrease their ability to uh, to uh, to, I guess, to direct what the policy outcomes are ultimately with our government. I and mean, there's there's uh, I am obviously not the first to say that either. But uh, you, you, you keep the I guess the plutocracy, uh, the uh, plutonomy from becoming a plutocracy. Right. Yeah. So this is another uh, important way of using taxes to influence the social and economic outcomes. Absolutely. So um, it's not that you have to tax the very wealthy in order to get dollars because, you know, some people I I read a piece the other day um, and the argument was that in order to help the poor, we must tax the rich. That because apparently money grows on rich people, and that's where dollars come from. And, and so we cannot possibly do anything until we have the acquiescence of those at the very top to higher taxes, which seems to me pretty implausible at this point if Congress is more or less uh, working in the service of those at the very top of the income scale, that uh, why, would you, why would you want to delay helping those at the bottom until such time as you can get those at the top to agree to higher taxes. I mean, I don't like the idea at all of, of setting, setting it up that way. But are there good reasons, reasons to raise taxes on those at the very top? Absolutely. Should you tie those reasons to funding and make helping those at the bottom contingent on raising uh, taxes on those at the top? I don't think so. I think that's a mistake. All right, and, and I know uh, I know we, we've held you for quite a while, and I and I appreciate. But let me just bear with me here. One, do you think that there is a growing understanding, uh, at maybe at the Fed or in other policy circles, of 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 this dynamic that we can actually uh, spend at a time where uh, demand is is still so lagging uh, that we can spend without Raising taxes. I mean, this you know, it's sort of this is where the sort of the economics and the the politics sort of cross uh, intersect on some level. That the if there becomes an, a a a growing urgency, which I, I don't know that we'll see, uh, in terms of what needs to be done in the economy, that policymakers will sort of accept this notion that we can actually spend without having to deal with the political implications of trying to raise taxes. Uh, do you do you have any hope that that message is getting is is uh, is getting is, is uh, there's some sympathy to that uh, notion in our policy circles? Well, I always have hope because it keeps it keeps me crawling out of bed every day to try to continue to <laughs> um, help people understand this stuff. But uh, it's it's really tough. I think that for me, over the years that I've been doing this, I've come to sort of believe that we need, it's got to come from the bottom up. It's better to try to educate regular Americans and to then have them apply pressure. So when they write to their, you know, congressman and they say, listen, uh, my town needs or my state needs or whatever, and the, the congressman responds, oh, I'd really love to help you. And gosh, I agree. That's a worthy project. But, you know, we don't have any money, so how are we going to? How are you going to pay for it? Question. That is, you know, the first line of defense 
against anything, whether it's infrastructure, education, healthcare, whatever it is, you got to get over that hurdle. How are you going to pay for it? And they, you know, they put their hands up and they say, well, we'd love to help you, but of course there's no money. So as worthy as this is, I, I have to say no. And the more that constituents turn on them and say, please don't tell me that you don't know where to get the U.S. dollar, okay, because I know where it comes from. And so tell me that you can't and, and won't spend on this project because you're worried that it's going to be inflationary, because you think that if we try to get the real resources mobilized to fix our infrastructure, that we're going to put too much strain on the economy and we're going to end up with inflation. That I can accept, but don't tell me that you don't know where to come up with the dollar, okay, because that I reject. And so I'm seeing more and more pieces in everything from local newspapers to magazines. That people, I think, are waking up to this and and I think the the more that message spreads, the more difficult it's going to be for people in Congress to say, you know, no, because it's an affordability question. It's not an affordability question. We've got to get our elected officials focused on what really matters, and that is, do we have the real resources in the economy? Do they exist? Do we have the people? Do we have the raw materials? Do we have the machines and the factories? Is there enough of that sort of stuff that if a government wanted to put those resources to work, move them around in the economy by providing the money, then can we do something significant without causing an inflation problem? And that's the bottom line. Stephanie Kelton, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Economics, Editor-in-Chief of the New, uh, New Economic Perspectives. We will link to that uh, on uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Genuinely appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sam. Speaking of... Um, of performance artists in Austin, Texas. Um, in Travis County, there's a custody case. There's a jury. Apparently, this is a very messy divorce. I generally don't have much interest in these things. Uh, but Alex Jones and his ex-wife, Kelly, have been locked in a child custody battle for, I guess, like three, almost four years. Uh, over the course of a divorce. And uh, there's going to be a trial in Austin. Two weeks. Anybody wants to sit in that trial and call in and give us uh, some highlights, please do. Lawyers for Kelly Jones will argue that Jones's public outburst suggests he's not a fit parent. And let me make it clear, I am agnostic in this respect. I would imagine so. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if I would want. I don't know if what I would do on this show, you know, this is not I'm not parenting. I'm doing a, a radio show. Um, do you tell your kids like, that you got to jump when you're done reading to them? Yes, I do. Okay. I got I, I know. Look, we got to jump. We got to do this quick. We got to wrap this up. <laughs> but. um The attorney for Alex Jones said using his client Alex Jones's on-air InfoWars persona to evaluate Alex Jones as a father would be like judging Jack Nicholson in a custody dispute based on his performance as the Joker in Batman. He's playing a character. Uh, well, it's said of Jones. He's a performance artist. Now, how I am on this show is not radically different from how I am off air. But you could say that I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on air, Sam, now, as opposed to normally. But the idea that I'm paying a, playing a fictional character yeah. where, you know, there are lines written for me that I don't accept as coming from me. You know, I said this when, when um, Andrew Breitbart died. He may be a very good dad or whatnot, good husband or, you know, nice son or brother or whatever he was. But in terms of how I know him, in his public persona, he was a horrible human being who um, really enhanced misery for people in a myriad of different ways. 
And so I judge him as a horrible human being and say, I'm glad that in the role that I knew Andrew Beipart, that he's no longer with us. I appreciate that, you know, he played a different role with his family, but I don't know him in that way. And I wouldn't comment and know of his death if he had only been a guy who was just a good dad. Actually, Sam, ironically, in the nature of transparency, also a terrible father. Yes. <laughs> but... And I don't think, like, you know, if you were ever in a divorce home, people like, have you heard him do uh, Nelson Mandela? Nelson no, clearly, Mandela. Clearly do a character. He's a guy who cannot but, take care listen, of children. But when, but Kelly Jones says he's not a stable person. Uh, she said of the man with whom her 14-year-old son, 9- and 12-year-old daughters have lived since their 2015 divorce. He says he wants to break Alec Baldwin's neck. He wants to J-Lo to get raped. I'm sorry, if you say these things... And the, and the name of your character that you're saying them is the na same name as you. And um, it's not really differentiated, but you've got to own it. It's not InfoWars hosted by insane asshole who says grotesque things in character. I'm concerned that he's engaged in felonious behavior threatening a member of Congress, she said. He broadcasts from home. The children are there watching him broadcast. I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know if um, the guy should not have custody of his kids because of, of this. But I do know that, I'm sorry, you can't pretend like this is a made-up character that somebody else is writing for you. you got to own this. This is not a movie that's clearly fictional. You've got to own it. And um, you've got to own your public persona. That's who you are to the vast majority of people who even know who you're talking about. What did what did what did he say to his wife? Like he, he goes, he goes, it, he, Alex Jones. Like, if you ever, uh, K, K, if you ever think that I would allow you to take my kid from me, don't you know that that's an impossibility? That's an impossibility. That that could that never could never happen. Happen. <laughs> that I would do everything in my power. Do you really want Mike Cernovich sitting on your doorstep? Do you really want Roger Stone to contract a Moldovan hacker to say that you're a female pedophile? I have one word to tell you. Plutonium. Plutonium. I actually think what's it, what I thought was interesting about it, though, was that like I, 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 it, it makes sense to me that at the, I'm sure that there is, in his case, some version of on and off air Alex Jones. But in some ways, like, oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Well, you've got to own what you say. Well, not only that, but in a certain way, it's like, and that becomes its own version of a compelling case. Like this guy is so cynical, and so kind of flippant in a way that, in character, quote unquote. You know, he'll shill for ridiculous projects. He'll, you know, threaten member of Congress. I mean, th there's an angle there too. Uh, I don't know for a but he shouldn't, shouldn't have his kids taken away from him um, unless it's like calling from a six one zero area code. Who's this? We say how soon is too soon. Uh, I guess it's not too soon to watch Alex Jones. This is a great Alex Jones clip because this is like how Alex Jones apparently interacts with his top secret sources, and then this is one of his lackeys. What's his name? Paul Watt. Jo Paul Paul Joseph Watson or just Joseph Paul Joseph Watson, and what's really funny here is a Paul Joseph Watson who's obviously made a career as a soft alt right Twitter guy and an Alex Jones lackey. He's a little uncomfortable by just how obvious Alex Jones is making the false flag, secret Antifa, ISIS, whatever the hell it is, angle on the horrific events of Las Vegas. Let's take a look. It could turn out to be, it wasn't left wing, it wasn't right wing, it wasn't an Islamic terrorist, it was just a mindless act of evil. It does happen sometimes where you just get mentally deranged people who are hopped up on whatever SSRI drugs. You know, the Batman shooter, he claimed he was motivated by all right, let me stop you. Wanted to become the Joker. Let so me stop you. We've got uh, we've got breaking breaking news uh, here, Paul Watson. Uh, that's absolutely critical, absolutely key. 
Uh, I have gotten this. And no cameras, please, guys. No cameras. <laughs> no cameras. This is from a law enforcement source. And the information is the news is lying. FBI HRT did the hit on the guy. And they found anti information in the room and photos of the woman in the Middle East. So he did not kill himself. The FBI hostage rescue team killed him because he was firing on them. So he did not want to be taken alive. And uh, reportedly he did it. Uh, and it was uh, anti for crap everywhere. And other things I'm not supposed to mention. That is directly from the hostage rescue team, by the way, Paul. And I'm going to delete this information now. <laughs> Keep going. Well, obviously, that's Keep huge. Going. That's huge if it turns out to be true. Yeah, hey, Paul, because... Paul, Paul, this is from high level CIA. <laughs> right here. Let's do it directly from. And this is from the hostage rescue team. You know, I don't make sources up. <laughs> Go ahead. No, all I'm saying is that I'm going on the information I have and I don't know. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I'm just saying this is big breaking news. This is huge. In fact, you go ahead and take over the next four minutes. Uh, you host. I'm going to run in here and get with the writers. Go. <laughs> Matt. Matt. It's my sources. <laughs> I didn't even understand that one. Because he's trying that he, it wasn't a false flag. It actually did. The guy was actually doing it, but he was antifa. But the whole thing was set up. And why? I like how Watson's just like <laughs> the best thing about Alex Jones. I don't think that there is anybody else who telegraphs themselves as much as he. Like I don't make up sources. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and every literally every like Watson sitting there like, Jesus, Alex, could you at least like fucking like pretend? Like, when you make up sources, could you not do it in real time? <laughs> but what was the theory there? Did you catch that? Well, I guess that? basically the media, for some reason, uh, and the cops, because the cops love to cover for Antifa. Yeah, the cops love Antifa, um, yes. Are, are they were Jew cops. The fact they're that, Seinfeld extras. That this guy cops. apparently went to, like... I don't know, Office Max or something, and printed off a bunch of Antifa, like, literature. Like, whatever, Antif like, punch Nazis, is that it? This guy and was, like, reading block, block manifestos from the 80s before, while he was, like, a retired real estate speculator who spent his life in casinos, and then it's like, yeah. Yeah, and sure. brought pictures of his, uh, whoever his partner is, uh, in the Middle East. Like, let's bring the most <laughs> incriminating. She's there in a... Look at her and Raka. Oh. Jesus. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, look. We've got to get to this because this is important. This is important. This is both a warning and I think could be uh, a piece of evidence in the next uh, Alex Jones custody case. I want you to know you're hearing this second here. If you heard it on uh, Alex Jones' show, you would have heard it first. But you're hearing it second. And here is Alex Jones giving us all a warning of what is coming, ladies and gentlemen. The elite psychopaths, they are seeing all this and are testing it on us and now really do have massive life extension. They've got stuff that's AI. It's just not self-aware, but it's artificially intelligent. And what we know they've got is so advanced that that's why they act like we don't even exist now. They've got a plan, they're carrying it out, and they don't want us to be aware of it or to have any culture. All right, pause it for one second. Let me just, I, you know, I hate to, to uh, ruin the fun of this segment, so let me get this over with first. Understand that when Alex Jones says the elite, they don't care about this because they have AI, they have life extension, they have all these, uh, they have the weather machine, they have all these things, these magical things that make them um, not have to care about us. That we're just basically, you know, like uh, those uh, eggs in the matrix that just provide them uh, energy. Um, the problem with this construct is that while he's right, they don't care about us. When you start to lard it up 
with because they have all of these special robots and magic machines and secret cults where they drink each other's blood and then you know change into uh, lizards or whatnot Very tasty. you are uh, you are obscuring the fact that really what it is is quite simple they have amassed so much money and wealth and power that they don't need to worry about us and they are doing it not through weather machines and not through you know secret rights that you know where everybody's like praising an owl or whatever the fuck it is they're doing it simply by things like rolling back the uh, state tax they are doing by destroying unions they're disempowering workers they are uh, doing about it by deregulating they are doing about it by amassing capital in a myriad of different ways that we as a society are basically making a choice and allowing them to do this. And when Alex Jones gets out there and starts talking about weather machines and this and that, all it does is disempowers and makes his uh, dumb followers sheep. Dumber, I guess. That's what kills me about the Alex Jones people. Like they're on the right track. Like they're right not to trust these people. But then they go way off into the I field. have always said that if Alex Jones didn't exist, the CIA would have invented him. And all right, now let's get to the fun part, because this is serious. I don't want us to be aware of it or to have any culture. And people that are part of it are scared, and they're there dutifully following their orders. You watch those Google, Facebook, and Twitter executives in those hearings attacking InfoWars. They were scared of Congress, and they were scared, and they were there like little scientists. Yes, sir, we're doing it. <laughs> Program operational, yes. We're going to shut them down, don't worry. Because they've been, they've been dialed in, okay? They want themselves to be safe. That's why almost none of them have families. That's right. Because they're saying no one in the EU leadership now has children except for five countries that are pulling out of it. They all have kids. All the major elites don't have children now, ladies and gentlemen, because they've been told you may not get access into the ARC centers, the below-ground facilities and places during this if you've got kids. And we don't want your kids there. They're like, we understand. I mean, we're close, folks. None of them are having kids. Because they wouldn't put kids through what's about to happen. Pause it. No, pause it. Pause it. We're going to go backwards. I want to make something absolutely clear, too. Their plan is to live forever. So they don't need kids to continue on with the species. That's why. So they go down to the ARC Center, they get their energy pills, they live forever, and they don't need kids. They're not going to need that because then we're also going to be turned into flo a floating orbs. All right, but continue. Kids. Because they wouldn't put kids through what's about to happen. I'm having more. I'm, putting, I'm taking everything. I'm putting everything I got on the table. I'm going to have more children. We're going into this. We're going to win. I'm putting everything on the line. I'm not a coward. I'm having more. And I love them more than my life a thousand times. And that's why I love them enough to put them on the table so they have a future. And I'm not going to give up on humanity just because these sick psychopaths have decided to bring in world government and kill everybody. I want to make something absolutely clear, too. I'm putting my children on the table because I own them. They're my chips. They're my chips. I'm putting them on the table. I'm putting them all in. I'm going to have more children. More children. And then they'll say he has a narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> Because of globalists. That's right. <laughs> um, Where did that come from? What's that fucking kids? Did he, did he lose uh, custody of his children in that uh, divorce fight? Did, uh, did, do we I, know? I believe so. I, I, and and yeah. maybe part of it has to do with the fact that he's putting them on the table as if they were yeah. like, like poker chips or a couple of quarters. Look, having white kids right now is very dangerous. <laughs> Black kids will be allowed underground. Not I little chubby ones from Texas. I would like to see the dating profile or Craigslist ad that Alex Jones puts up seeking someone to bear these children. Are you kidding me? Alex I'm, Jones is going to clean up. I'm going to do it. I'm going to. We're, we're obviously, we just, I, I ejaculate into a bottle of uh, super beta male vitality oh. and it grows. Super beta male <laughs> grows vitality. Grows out of. That was a Freudian slip. Super beta male vitality. <laughs> what is it? Alpha male? Uh, wait, We've got everything. Uh, We've got A through Z. Go. Zeta a, a mentality. Z. Zeta mentality. <laughs> We've got all of it. That's what I want. That sounds very relaxed, man. Zeta mentality. Just on the we just grow them like, in whatever. an incubator cool. here in the uh, studios. Completely impromptu. Baby, I need you The back. way I got into that. Uh, Baby, I want you back. The way I got we into that uh, formula. Completely impromptu. Baby, I need you back. That was a completely impromptu 
uh, masturbation session. <laughs> um, Alex Jones will probably end up being like one of the only major figures in media uh, to not be sexually harassing his staff. I, He'll be too busy taking care of shit. I yeah. would be very surprised if there were even women working there. Yeah. No. <laughs> Why would there be women working here? Uh, I mean, I... I, I to Mike Pence rule, unprompted. Um, I would be surprised. He, it would surprise me if he was. You know, I want to say something. I think people. was it, I think Brent and I were talking about this. We make a lot of um, comments, and a lot of people make a lot of comments. Actually, more m- nasty comments than we do. That the sort of before and after photos that he posts up of these miracle products don't usually show a before and after, which was one it's of what the, happens on the inside. The most amazing Alex Jones things imaginable, but. When he was in Seattle, and the guy called him like a you know an asshole or something, and he sprinted at him, he had real legs. I had never like that guy knows how to move, well, and I had never ever seen anything from Alex Jones before that would indicate any type of athletic capacity. But the way he sprinted after that guy was very impressive. huge athlete. Of course, so he got might be maybe complete training. Maybe something is to every size, Michael. Ooh, <laughs> only you. Could do a out, turn an Alex Jones joke into a reverse judo accusation of fat shaming. I see you, I see you, Miss Woke. Oh, I was. There I will not be taken down. He, he ran. He ran really well. Yeah, I was there when he took a swing at a Chank in Cleveland too. Wait, he took a. I didn't see that. I never even heard that he took a swing. Right, he did a swing. He sort of uh, came into the thing. He don't no, he didn't take a swing at Jank. He, he menaced him. Menaced no, him. Jank was there going, like, we hate Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> what is anybody? <laughs> and Alex Jones is just there like, this is great TV. All right, everybody keep it on the field. Keep it on the field. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, 10 for a beer now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, go you get, guys uh, want a drink? I don't like, actually. More clicks for everybody. I mean, to be honest with you, I think Listen, Obama, guys, Obama did a pretty good job managing the economy. Guys, I want, you, was to have, I want you to have this. I uh, give you a little. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's two women. At oh, there's two women. There's two women. At women at Alex okay. Jones is probably totally cool, insane, offset. He's I I don't like, think that's yeah, true. I do. I I don't <laughs> I don't think that's true. Oh, he totally is. I think. <laughs> listen, this is the thing: is that um, how are you monetizing your show? Oh, I that's don't cool. want it's a grassroots model. I don't want to. Um, I don't want people to take this uh, literally, because I'm only using this as a metaphor. Let me put it that way. But. Metaphorically speaking, let's say you were Gary Busey, <laughs> and you can be both um, out of your mind, metaphorically, and, and metaphorically. also mo- monetize it, and be have a, a level of self awareness to monetize it, right? And also be out of your mind. Capitalism so, wouldn't reward antisocial behavior, so Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there's no place for antisocial disorders in capitalism. I think he's probably so paranoid around the office that, at the very least, like he probably. But I'm going beyond the no harassment thing. I'm saying you meet him and he's literally like, "Yeah, how long you been doing majority?" Uh, no, I don't. I think remember that's you at Sex in the City. Yeah, it was good work. Yeah. All right, let's go do the segment. Listen, guys, you're trying to kill my children. That was okay. Great. And that's over. You know what? That was really good. I that was a great fake I fight. Like, I especially. want you guys to each have yeah. a special complimentary bottle. This is actually my signature stuff. It's pretty good. Saint <laughs> Alex Jones. Saint Alex Jones. The wackiest the new, character, the character yet. Right. This, exactly. I give you guys this. This is my special reserve. It has. 43% less lead uh, than the other stuff. I just so, think the problem is with gun No heavy that, metals. Uh, that one I actually don't have ma- manufacturing. The base China. is so fervent that they'll never have any common sense proposals. Oh, we're on air? You're All trying right. to kill my children. <laughs> Hi, folks. Sam Cedar here. We still need your help on our Patreon page. YouTube abs have come back, but not nearly as much as we had before. So if you can help us out, any little bit helps. Head over to our Patreon page right at this URL, and you'll help us keep helping you by making videos.